It's a great pleasure and a privilege to, to be giving this paper today to this uh, great community of, of Herodotians and beyond. So, and thank you all for being here. Um, as I mentioned in the abstract I circulated, I will be concentrating on the human body in Herodotus' battle scenes, uh, but I will also broaden the scope to encompass non-battle scenes involving nudity, gender, and ethnography. Um, because these settings outside of the battlefield are important points of reference and comparison when examining the role of the human body in war narratives uh, in, of classical Greece and their socio-political context. And as you just said, I, I will be drawing on some um, other, other things I've, I've done on death in Herodotus and uh, some uh, discussions on, of intertextuality, of Homeric intertextuality. Both fields are very fertile and there have been some excellent uh, work, uh, excellent, excellent things written on, on, on both areas. And I'm greatly indebted also to the Herodotus Helpline for hosting uh, excellent discussions. Even when I wasn't present, I, I, wouldn't, I wasn't able to, to attend live. I have uh, tried to catch up with the recording. So they have been very, uh, a great support to me. Um, so, uh, I will be uh, going through the structure of the talk. I start with an introduction mentioning uh, some things about the human body as a general category of examination, and then some general things about the human body in Herodotus. And then I will move on to those non-battle contexts in Herodotus, which I distinguish in violent, non-violent contexts. And then I will move on to battle contexts. And eventually I will explore with you uh, a question, which is um, uh, how far we can take Herodotus to be Homeric or unHomeric in his description of the body in battle and attempt a critical exploration. And uh, I would be very grateful for your comments and discussion uh, afterwards. So uh, for the first part of my introduction, um, the human body as a general category can help us approach questions of history, literature, and art. And the ancient past, of course, is no exception. Tracing the human body in a text or set of texts can illuminate cultural, historical, and literary questions, which are interrelated. Perceptions of beauty, athletics, nudity, warfare, ethnic, social, gender identity, sexuality, and, of course, questions of what we call comprehensively intertextuality, the communication of the text of a later text with a previous text or more previous, more than one previous texts or contemporary texts. And of course, it also helps us explore questions of audiences or receivers of the text. And broadly speaking, the area of reception studies is the general area where such questions are made. Um, and I would like also to concentrate on the concept of experience as quite meaningful in tracing the human body in a text. Uh, the human body within a text is the subject of experience, and at the same time, through its actions, states, sufferings, it generates experiences in the viewer. For example, a nude body in the text provokes emotions, reflections, or other reactions in the viewer's in the narrative, let's call them internal viewers, and in the implied audiences or readers of the text, external viewers. These can be Herodotus' contemporary audience of the fifth century or we today. So war is a big theme in Herodotus as in all the historians. And in war narratives, the human body often appears in contexts of wounding, suffering, death, which in Greek culture in particular, constitute both the darkest and the finest hour of the body. Uh, the darkest obviously because it is about death, um, uh, wounding, loss of strength, uh, loss of beauty. And after all, death is a dark place in Greek uh, culture and beyond. But it's also the finest and the brightest hour of the body with, by the Greeks, uh, because these contexts of bodily decay and death are associated with uh, what the Greeks called arete, excellence, or fame for all time, kleos. And uh, 
these are key concepts, of course, in Greek uh, of, of Greek military ethics, which are also associated with uh, memory. These deaths undergo a process of monumentalization, and they are commemorated by the community at local and panhellenic levels through festivals and uh, memorials of all kinds. And they constitute uh, what Loro has called beautiful deaths. Uh, they are culturally, culturally framed as such. And the protagonists of those beautiful deaths are predominantly men, exclusively men, actually. Uh, battle context in Herodotus involves some women, such as Artemisia, for example, but when it comes to these beautiful deaths and the close-ups of the human body in battle, it's men who dominate. And another distinctive feature of these deaths is that it, they are conceptual, they are framed in ethnic terms as we and the others. And in Herodotus battlefields, uh, the others are predominantly the Persians in relation to those great battles, great from the perspective of the Greeks. Uh, Marathon, Salamis, Thermopylae, some of these uh, contexts I will be mentioning a little later. But as I said before, turning the focus to the heavily gendered human body in Herodotus battle scenes, I will look at the human body in non-battle contexts selectively. Uh, and I, I, uh, I will be making this distinction between violent and non-violent contexts of the non-battlefield uh, scenes. And borrowing Deborah Bedeker's uh, term of dialogic or multi-vocal applied to Herodotus text, we could say that in non-combat scenes, the appearance of the human body is much more multivocal uh, in the sense that it encompasses both men and women uh, and individuals of different statuses, ethnic backgrounds, um, occupations, free or enslaved persons, seers, etc. So uh, starting from the huma, human body in non-battle contexts and the non-violent context among these, I, my first case is Candabli's wife. And I've put on slide some key words, nudity, gender in relation to female body, private and public sphere, culture, that is nomos, and ethnic identity. So it's one of the most prominent tales of uh, female agency in Herodotus. Uh, his, uh, Candabli's is the king of Lydia, who was succeeded by Gigis, his favorite uh, bodyguard. The story is also found in Plato's Republic and in different variants elsewhere. Uh, and indeed, the public and the private interlock. So it is an affair of erotic passion, which eventually leads to a change of dynasty in the royal succession of the Lydian kingdom. So uh, the story is that Candablis was so much in love with his own wife that he thought she was the most beautiful of all uh, women. He tried to persuade his uh, bodyguard Gigis about that, but words were not enough, he felt. So he made him go into the bedroom. He, he asked him to go into, uh, to, see her, to see her naked. And um, Gigis tried to avoid this uh, <laughs> anomon uh, thing, this contrary, go, going contrary to custom. Um, and he says that uh, a woman who sheds her clothes, she sheds her modesty as well, I do. Uh, but royal will is stronger than his, and he is uh, brought into the royal uh, bedroom where he watches the queen naked, uh, um, and uh, she, and he, afterwards he, he leaves the room, but the woman sees him, a bora, and she understands what was going on. Uh, the episode is replete with uh, words of vision. So from being the object of viewing, the queen becomes the viewer herself, and this vision uh, uh, makes her realize and conceive a plan of revenge. She presents uh, Gigis with a dilemma, either kill Candaulis and seize the throne with me as your wife, or die yourself on the spot so that never again may your blind obedience to the king tempt you to see what you have no right to see. One of you must die, either he who conceived the plot or you who saw me naked when it was inappropriate to do so. Uno mis domina, against nomos. And um, again, Gigis tries to persuade uh, the royal um, the, the party, uh, the female royal party to spare him. Uh, 
uh, from this uh, difficult task, uh, but uh, the royal uh, will is stronger and the queen gives him an NK Rivion, a dagger, and hides him. We will attack him when he's asleep, she's asking, and on the very spot where he showed me him make So in this manner, Gigi kills Kandaulis and takes both the throne and his wife. And we assume that from this point onwards, the viewing is legitimate. He will continue to see the queen naked, but uh, as her husband and uh, king. So nothing paranomon against custom here. Um, and in this narrative of this local and private episode, we find a wider comment about uh, ethnographic comment about, about nudity by the historical narrator. In Lydia, in fact, more or less throughout the non-Greek world, it is a source of great shame even for a man to be seen naked. So we can keep that in mind uh, for later on. And um, I would like to go now, actually before going to the, uh, the tale of Agaristi, uh, I just want to point out that nudity is taken as a criterion of ethnic differentiation on this occasion between Greeks and non-Greeks. And the fere in the previous uh, statement, Aishunin Megalen fere, it is a source of, of uh, shame. This present anchors it, anchors this view in the fifth century um, perceptions. And Herodotus, ex sorry, external audiences are meant to recognize the Greek cultural norms and institutions pertaining to nudity, and especially male nudity in more specifically athletic and warfare contexts. And Thucydides too draws a, a, um, a contrast between Greeks and non-Greeks in relation to nudity in Greek athletic contexts in the archeology. span And I will go to this passage a little later. So now we'll move on to Agaristi. In my keywords here are vision, nudity, shame, and custom again, and the human body in, in its parts. So Agaristi has no agency in this story, this young girl of uh, the daughter of Cleisthenes of Sicyon. So basically the story can be renamed as Cleisthenes audition for a son-in-law. Um, she is just the narrative peg for a story of elite men of Panhellenic distinction associated with athletics and the symposium. Um, and there are many points of interest in this, uh, in this story. Uh, it has been discussed in the light of, uh, of lists of Olympic victors, of, of Indian folktail, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, the story can be dated, and it must have taken place around 575 BC. I'm using a lot of some of the commentary of Hornblower and Pelling by, uh, in 2017 published on, on book six of Herodotus. So Cleisthenes of Sicyon, in the context of Olympic games in which he himself had taken victory, uh, equestrian victory, uh, issues a call for any Greek man with a claim to pride to put themselves forward for becoming uh, his uh, son-in-law. And there would be a prolonged period of audition uh, of one year. They would stay in Sikyun and undergo multiple contests. And you can see here on the, on the screen, um, he has made a race track and wrestling ground for them. And he would take the younger ones out to the gymnasia. So let's keep that in mind. Um, so the commentators say, I'm telescoping, they telescoping actually Herodotus' text, Cleisthenes was interested in athletic prowess, deportment, good breeding, andragatie, and more important of all, behavior at the symposium. So uh, the, the crucial uh, scene is, uh, which involves some nudity, is uh, the day when uh, Cleisthenes was going to announce the outcome of uh, his, um, his audition. Uh, and uh, he, he threw uh, um, a fist and he um, and when the, the time of the drinking came, uh, this young man, Hippocleides of Athens, who was his favorite suitor up till, uh, until that moment, 
uh, he didn't do very well at the end because he started, he asked for a tune, he started to dance, then he asked for a table to be brought in. He put his head on the table and made gestures with his legs in the air. And because of the dance and the anaideian and the lack of shame, and actually this is a hendia dis uh, that is saying two things for one. So uh, dancing and lack of shame is in fact shameless dancing because of his shameless dancing. Um, Kleisthenes completely uh, decided to, um, he, he became completely exasperated and he said, you dance your, your marriage away in this famous, um, in this famous instance and, um, and phrase. So, um, Before I move on, um, what do we have here? Uh, what is problematic here is the fact that uh, Hippocleides, with his uh, gestures with the, with the feet, obviously he displays his idoia, his genitals. And the problem, as the commentators say, is that nobody was seeing anything new. A man was going to display his idoia in, uh, in the gymnasia we just saw. So uh, nothing wrong with nudity itself, but the problem here, the shamelessness was uh, in that the nudity took place in the wrong context. That was a problem here. So let me go to some violent contexts outside of the battle. This time uh, I'm, I'm dealing with Cleomenes self-harm and death. So uh, Cleomenes, the Spartan king, uh, he came to Sparta and he was, uh, became ill with madness uh, and uh, he was put in, in the stocks. Um, how private or public was his uh, imprisonment, we don't know exactly. But anyway, this is not my interest. He asked, he found somehow from a helot, um, a cideron, uh, a knife, and he started cutting first his shins, then he moved up to the, his thighs, then he went to his hips, his flanks, until he began slicing into his stomach, uh, at which point he died. And this katahordeugon uh, is uh, this, the uh, very, very graphic verb of slicing up yourself like a sausage. Um, so this is particularly, this must have been um, a very bloody scene. Before I go to, uh, to comment on blood, I just wanted to say that laparas, flanks, is a word found in the Iliad, but otherwise mainly in the medical authors. And in the histories, it also crops up in relation to Egyptian embalming. And as I said, Katahordevon is, is slicing up for uh, like a sausage. So the scene must have been very bloody, but blood never appears on the surface of the text here. We don't have it. And uh, this is where my, um, my chapter in, in the, um, in the volume about Homeric intertextuality comes in uh, because I had an appendix there where I, I went through the, those 15 passages um, where blood actually appears in Herodotus. And this is how the appendix looks. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the, the, the passages but I will be dealing with Cyrus' uh, blood. Uh, so I, I'm giving the passages and then uh, the extract and then the, the context, whether it's military or non-military scene. Um, I think that the absence of a reference to blood in this gruesome scene of Cleomenes is arguably something of a paradox. And uh, in fact, within the histories, it represents the norm regarding the use of the word. Um, so although we have a, a very rich panorama of, uh, of, of trauma, humiliation, um, suffering, and death, blood as a word is very, very scant, as I said. And uh, the last two occurrences, number 14 and 15 in my table, uh, are somehow related. Most of the others relate to ethnographic contexts, non-Greek contexts, such as uh, the Persian Farnuhis, the Egyptian Saminitus, Scythian and Arab customs. Uh, but in numbers 14 and 15, we move closer to Greek contexts, but they are part of hexametric oracles uh, in relation to Salamis. So again, not on the battlefield. 
Right, let's move to the battlefield. Uh, starting with Cyrus' death, as I said, uh, so some battle scenes and framing narrative, collective and individual deaths, ethnicity, naming and unnaming. Uh, it is about the battle of the Persians with the Massagetans, which is fashioned as an extraordinary event by Herodotus. He says, I, uh, by the historical narrator, I consider this to be the fiercest battle between non-Greeks that has ever been. And in fact, I have information that this was actually the case. But again, as you see in on the battlefield, on the actual battle, the, 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 the deaths are reported very tersely. We have this patterning of, um, we have a prolonged battle where both sides fight and stand their ground. We have this succession of, of weapons, first arrows, and when arrows finish, they come to blows in closer combat with spears, spears and daggers. And they resist for a long time. And eventually uh, we have this uh, single word statement of death the Persians, uh, Dieftare, a good number of the Persian army uh, was killed and so was killed. Uh, and so Cyrus died. So in the main battle, this very short, very brief statement of death. In the posthumous, in the, in the after the main battle narrative, we have this detail about Tomiris' revenge for the fate of her, of her um, son where she fills a, a wine skin with human blood. She searches among the Persian corpses for Cyrus' body. She shoves, uh, she has uh, her head, his head uh, shoved into the wine skin and she maltreated the, the body and she addresses the body. And there she, she mentions uh, that I, I quench, I told, I told you I would quench your thirst for blood and so I shall. Um, so the episode with Cyrus and the Massagetans is a story where wine and its association with madness plays a role. And uh, this is uh, also the case with one of the versions about Cleomenes' madness. Um, but unlike Cleomenes' death, which is bloodless on the surface of the text, as we saw, there is no mention to blood there. In the episode of, this, of, the, of Cyrus' death and the Massagetans, Blood appears four times in all cases before and after the main battle narrative in the frame narrative. And with this, I'm moving to Thermopylae, but before moving to Thermopylae, let us keep in mind a couple para of parameters uh, which might help us read battle narratives. Uh, starting from the Persians versus Massagetans and maybe using this as, an, as, as useful for the Greeks versus Persians at Thermopylae, and as I said, potentially more broadly to work in progress. So I'd like to ask your views about these parameters. So uh, in relation to the battle, uh, Persians versus Massagetans, we have, and Thermopylae, we have a certain extraordinariness in the battle. There's something extraordinary about these battles. They are prolonged battles. And there is this succession of weapons. First X weapon, then Z, then Y in Thermopylae. We'll see that. We have groups and individuals, collective deaths, individual deaths. And a relevant parameter is naming and non-naming of those who die. Sometimes the, the groups are non-named, the individuals are named. And some individuals, yes, I have some individuals of distinction. Another important parameter is the viewpoint, and, and Landon has a useful discussion about uh, cinematic language, high camera, middle camera, low camera, how far the camera zooms into the body. And as I just said, it, it, plays, it makes a difference whether we have the main narrative or the framing narrative of the battle of, of, of the, battle of the main uh, uh, action where people die. And we have different amount of detail about the human body there. So on to Thermopylae, um, it is a very intricate narrative. So uh, the, 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 the reporting of casualties, uh, re you know, it is mentioned at different places. So I've put here on the slide about Persian casualties. Persians fall in great numbers, they're reported. 
And we have that in your first statement, uh, the Medes rushed uh, the Greek position and died in large numbers, were badly mauled, and then later on in the culminating phase, Persian casualties were high. Uh, we have the, the, the comment that they were flogged. Uh, of course, it's this flogging of the Persians contrasted by the Greeks who choose their death, uh, have a greater agency over their death. So there is this patriotic agenda there. Um, and within the general um, and uh, very brief, uh, very terse reporting of death, we have this um, this information about some this, some persons of distinction and some naming about the two sons of Darius, Abrocomis and Hyperanthes, and some material about uh, their kinship um, uh, to the king's royal family. Now, on the Greek side again. In the main battle, when action takes place on the battlefield, we have um, a very, um, before I go to action, we have the group and individuals. Uh, obviously, Leonidas stands out as the named leader, and the 300 are anonymous and uh, purposefully anonymous, actually, as we, uh, as we will see. Um, and not only is he named, <laughs> but we're given his, uh, his, um, his city, of course, his uh, patronymic and his genealogy. Eventually, he is a son of Heracles. And again, he's mentioned as a Heraclid Leonidas. So this mythical genealogy is kept at the background uh, as a strategy of, of, uh, of importance for the leader and uh, memory. Um, so yes, here we are, the, the, the standard verb pipte aner. So he falls. This terse statement of death, uh, we have the means of the Xiphasi dear Gazdondo. They they used swords to kill the Persians, uh, but actually the death itself uh, uh, of Leonidas and the anonymous three hundred um, select Spartans uh, is uh, by a single verb. Um, and. Here we have also the pattern of using different uh, means of uh, fighting different weapons. Uh, so we have knives, and then eventually, when um, they lost the, the first spears, then swords, and then eventually they weaponize, as it were, their hands and, and mouths. So as the ultimate uh, means of fighting, whereas the foreigners, the barbaroi, uh, overwhelmed them with missile weapons. So in that sense, it's a difference between Thermopylae and the Persians and the Massagetans, uh, because in the Persians and the Massagetans, somehow the missiles are on both sides are similar, but here we have a great difference between the, 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 um, the weapons that the Greeks have ending with hands and mouth, mouths and uh, the weapons that the Persians have. Right. Um, and we have the posthumous or the post-battle narrative where we have something of an analogy with Cyrus, but a different occasion in terms of the ethnographic comment we get. So Xerxes recognizes someone has someone points to to, to uh, Leonidas' body, and uh, he has it has his head in, impaled. But the comment we get here is that this is against. It's a paran. It, 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 this is of course is a paranomia, paranomise. He wouldn't have done this if he weren't so uh, irritated against Leonidas. So we have a justification of this brutality on the side of the Persians whereas we don't get this justification uh, for Tomiris, of course, and the Massagetans. And something else which is interesting in relation to the human body and the framing narrative of the battle, it's this pre-battle uh, incident, uh, scene of the exercising Spartans, where uh, Xerxes sends a scout to see, um, and we have again uh, uh, verbs of vision, and the scout watches the Spartans exercising outside the wall and na naked and combing their hair. Um, and he's very surprised. He sees and, and wonders. 
and he's trying to, to make notes about the, the numbers and he goes back to Xerxes and Xerxes sees all this as completely unbelievable and he's also laughing. We have this emphasis on laughter, geloia, gelota. He tries to understand from the expatriate part of Demaratus and he, Demaratus reminds him, I told you, remember, but again, despite Demaratus' explanations, he's not persuaded. So, um, although the scene of the exercising Spartan strikes Xerxes and the scouters is incomprehensible and ridiculous, it is perhaps worth noticing that it doesn't strike him as, laugh, as shameful as well. As we saw in the story of Candabli's wife, it was a source of great shame even for a man to be seen naked among the Lydians and most of the barbarians. On this occasion, neither Xerxes nor the scout make any comment about the nakedness of the exercising Spartans. So at least within the narrative of the histories, this is a moment where perhaps a sort of a paradoxical absence takes place. We have no comment on the nakedness. Another thing that is a paradox in, in Herodotus' battle scenes, uh, when viewed now against their Homeric background, is the absence of the wounded and dying body in combat. Herodotus has been acknowledged as um, the most Homeric of authors. And um, as we saw, uh, he does not shun gruesome descriptions of death in general. Uh, yet, as far as the human body in battle is concerned, his departure from his Homeric archetype is noticeable. This departure becomes even more noticeable in the Battle of Thermopylae, whose debt to Homer is significant, as has been, again, widely discussed and excellently in the bibliography. Uh, in Homer, the dying moments of the heroes who fall in battle are often described in excruciating anatomical detail. As we know, they fall on the ground with a din, they groan, they soak the earth with their blood, and so on and so forth. But nothing of the sort happens in the most Homeric Herodotus. So why does he depart so sharply from his poetic archetype? And here where I would like to explore with you some, some ideas. I use the framework of discourse analysis to explore this question. I just want to say that the, this the question, of course, is not new in the bibliography. Deborah Bedeker and Ove Street have uh, make, made suggestions, uh, and I, I discuss that in more detail, the, the, the literature background in, in that um, chapter about Homeric intertextuality. Um, and there I have argued that instead of seeing this departure from the Homeric text as un-Homeric, it's probably better, I suggest, to see it as an evocation, as a means of evoking it. Now, how? The theoretical framework I use to make the suggestion is uh, that of the critical discourse analysis, as I said, uh, and the empirical study of silence or absence in specific contexts. Key concepts in this empirical analysis of the text are meaningful absences and meaningful silences, not identical, but adjacent concepts. How can we systematically identify and analyze absences? How do we come to know these absences? How are absences determined by what is semiotically present? What is there in the text, as Schroeder and Taylor say in this uh, uh, study I'm using? For something to be perceived as meaningfully absent, there has to be at least one thinkable alternative presence that comes to mind. And in order for this alternative presence to come to mind, there has to be a context in which this presence is possible or expected. I quote from the study, silence and absence are of interest to us in that they can be interpreted and it is only possible if they are relatable to an alternative presence that can be spelled out. So building on this theoretical background, I have argued that the many Homeric features that are there in Herodotus text, which I call we call discursive presences, well acknowledged since antiquity, create a Homeric context or a suitable textual environment 
where Herodotus' departure from Homer when it comes to the wounded and dying body in battle can be construed by his audience, by his audiences, as a meaningful absence. By whom and for whom is this text produced? When? How do fifth century sociopolitical factors interact with the Homeric text, such as military ethics of, of death and perceptions of heroism, political and social institutions, technologies of war? So in order to examine uh, an example, I have, I have a few minutes, I guess, so I'll just take them for um, the final bit. Um, in order to examine an example of this inter interaction, I would like to go back to the pre-battle scene at Thermopylae of the exercising Spartans and the absence of the ethnic others comment through their gaze in relation to the Spartans' naked bodies. I refer to this absence as a sort of a cultural paradox in the histories. I would like to push this line of interpretation further by suggesting that this absence is conditioned by Greek heroic ethics of the classical period and Herodotus' subtle construction of, of a beautiful death in the socio-political context of the fifth century. And it is also an example which illuminates Herodotus' interaction with Homer. So these Spartans have a double identity of athlete warriors, taking part in athletic contests before going to battle. The athletic games taking part outside the wall at Thermopylae are narratologically compressed and almost inconspicuous. For this reason, they have escaped attention as a moment of Homeric interaction because they can be, or although they are inscribed in the text through the single word gymnasdomenus. And I suggest this gymnasdomenus, the single word, can, be, can, can evoke the full-blown Homeric example of the funeral games of Patroclus in Iliad 23, where again we watch Homeric heroes competing as athletes after having watched them fighting as warriors in the same narrative. The scene of the exercising Spartans also interacts with Achilles' deadly chase uh, of Hector around the walls of Troy in Iliad 22, which is fashioned as an athletic chase, an athletic context whose prize is psyche, Hector's psyche, the life. And there is an impressive concentration of athletic language here, athlia. Athlon, Athlophori, we have gaze of the, of, the, of the gods, and of course, the life of Hector. I won't read because I think I will press on a little. The other aspect of the scene, in addition to nudity, is the long hair. So these men are combing their hair. And earlier in the histories, in 182, in relation to the Battle of the Champions, an archaic battle, uh, of the archaic period, I mean, uh, Argives versus um, uh, Spartans versus Argives over Thyrea, we are given a, a mythical, uh, a fictional explanation of the long hair of the Spartans. At the same time, the Spartans' long hair evoke the formulaic description long haired Achaeans, Kari Commandes Acheoi. I have something on the chat, so I'll just. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were telling me to, <laughs> to wrap it up. I am. Um, right. So this evokes also a Homeric phrase, long hair Achaeans in Homer. So the long hair of the male body in Herodotus functions as an aspect of cultural continuity between past and present. On the other hand, as far as nudity is concerned, such cultural continuity becomes more problematic. In fact, male nudity marks a change in Greek cultural norms and a transition from the archaic to the classical period, with the Spartans being attributed a pioneering role in it. The key evidence for this idea is found in Thucydides' archaeology, where we are told that the Spartans were the first two to strip naked for the games, to take off their clothes in public, and to rub themselves with oil after exercise. Originally, even in the the Olympic Games, contending athletes took part with loincloths covering their genitals, idoia, uh, sorry, uh, yes, the genitals, and it is not many years since this practice ceased. Some barbarians, even now, especially in Asia, hold boxing and wrestling contests, athla, in which loincloths are worn. 
There are many other resemblances one could point to between the old Greek and the present barbarian ways of life. So the absence of nudity in the old days, he says, is a proof that there are many commonalities between the old Greek and the present, uh, and the present uh, barbarian ways of life. So on this occasion, cultural norms of the distant past reveal similarities with the ethnic other and no differences. And I'm concluding, the nude athlete warriors of Herodotus Hermopylae is a departure from the Homeric text and the world it represents. In Homer, athletes compete wearing loincloths. Furthermore, in Homer, nudity through the word gymnos, gymnos is associated with the warrior's dead body and inability to fight because of deprivation of armor, associated with weakness and shamefulness. You see the, uh, just the Hector's words in Iliad 22, uh, he will kill me uh, naked like a woman. Uh, and Priam's uh, words in 22, uh, without actually using the word gymnos on this occasion, provide perhaps the most compelling description of shameful nudity of a dead man's body in war setting through the image of an old man's corpse being mauled by dogs. So by inscribing the nudity of the Spartan warrior athletes in his text, Herodotus anchors the scene in fifth century Greek institutions and ideals of masculinity and excellence. At the same time, by compressing it in a single word, gymnazestai, and not giving narratorial space to it, he allows the Homeric elements of the scene to resonate with fifth century audiences, I suggest, without bringing to the foreground fifth century institutions and realities which would sort of be in conflict or spoil the Homeric evocation. The scene of the exercising Spartans at Thermopylae is only one example, which enables us to observe Herodotus' subtle interaction with the Homeric text through a cultural perspective of the human body. In this paper, I have argued that Herodotus' battle scenes and the human body's discursive presences or meaningful absences in them is part of uh, Herodotus Homeric intertextuality rooted in his audience's experience and the socio-political conditions and sensibilities of the fifth century BC. Thank you.